And it looks like we're live again on Twitch. So hello, Twitch, and uh, hello, everybody who is still on the live stream. Uh, you have to deal with me once again. That said, uh, I'm going to be monitoring questions on my phone over here. What we're going to talk about in this section is a little bit of a deeper dive into an actual architecture with uh, Comprehend. And we're going to do that using Twitter's API. Um, I have to ask, does anybody work for Twitter? Great, so we're all among friends. Um, I have to say that Twitter is, is really just one of the most frustrating APIs to work with. Uh, I, I think that they are actively hostile towards their developers. It's, it's super frustrating. And I don't understand why they have this mentality. But um, how many of you tried to sign up for a Twitter account today, uh, for a Twitter dev account? And how many of you have been approved? Oh, wow, it's way higher than normal. Uh, normally, it's zero. So the, the Twitter has recently gone through this thing where they've redone a bunch of their APIs. Um, and they've made it quite a bit harder to get access at an API level to some of the stuff. Whereas previously, if you were an engineer or a dev and you just wanted an app, all you would do is you would go to the developers.twitter.com and you would register your app and it would be done. Uh, and then they would only ask you to fill out all of this extra information if you, if you were going to be using certain complex uh, APIs if you're going to be requesting user email addresses and things like that. Uh, but now they want all that information, period. Uh, and it takes days to get your account approved. Has anybody waited more than one day? Yeah? OK. So I mean, it's, it's not ideal. But uh, for those of you who do have Twitter accounts, you're more than welcome to follow along with what we're going to present now. For those of you who don't, uh, you're just kind of SOL. I'm sorry. So. With that in mind, and with my rant about Twitter over, let's talk about text analytics solutions uh, with Comprehend and uh, some of the other stuff. This is me again. You guys, we're, we're all here this morning, right? OK, I, I just, I'm a dude. I'm an engineer. I'm not particularly, I don't have a fancy title or anything. I'm not in sales. I'm not in marketing, really. I just, I, I like coding all day, and it's really weird to be in front of all of you. Hi, Twitch. Um, so with that said, uh, we organize, you, you guys remember this all from this morning. Was anybody not here this morning? OK. Um, well, we're skipping this because <laughs> if, if it were like 10 people, I would have done it. But since it's only one, um, I guess for the purposes of the Twitch audience, let me briefly cover this. Uh, and I apologize to those of you in the room who have already seen this once before. But uh, at AWS, we think about our Amazon, our, our services in, in three kind of tiers. We have our API tier, which is our application level services that you access over an HTTP API. Those are things like recognition for video and for pictures, transcribe for doing speech to text, translate for doing English to German or French to English, and all kinds of things like that. And then poly for doing text to speech, and comprehend for doing the, uh, the analytics portion of, of text, so if we want to detect the parts of speech, if we want to detect the sentiment, if we want to detect the, uh, the key entities. And then Lex for communicating with our families and friends. It's a chatbot service. Uh, and then at the platform level services, we have Amazon SageMaker and Amazon EMR and Glue and Mechanical Turk. And these are tools that make it very easy to accomplish machine learning uh, at scale at, uh, with a managed platform. And then underlying all of that, are our frameworks and interfaces and infrastructure. And that infrastructure level is powered by things like our P3 instances and all that good stuff. Uh, today, we're talking primarily about translate and comprehend. So we're going to take tweets that are coming in in any language, and we're going to translate them into English. We're going to run comprehend on them. And we're going to generate uh, a data set of what, it, what is the, the average sentiment of this, this item that we're going to be tracking. So this is what it's going to look like in the end. Uh, this is a quick site dashboard that we're going to build. And all we're going to do is we're just going to grab all of these records that are incoming. I think I'm still grabbing records currently, and I have been for now two weeks. So there's going to be a whole bunch of data. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and we're primarily just going to be discussing things like uh, 20, 2017, AWS, AWS reInvent, Amazon. We're going to have kind of things like that. Um, and you can see the translated text on the bottom. So uh, this is what we're building. Let's talk a little bit about how the architecture works. So you have the Twitter API, and Twitter has something called the Site Streams API. And the Site Streams API is a long-lived connection that you create. Um, I think the endpoint is slash status slash filter or something. Uh, and you basically open this connection, and you say, I want to track the following list of topics, and I want you to send me 
all of the tweets that uh, correspond to those topics that I'm tracking. And Twitter will send you a JSON payload of that you know, tweet or that event or whatever that's coming in. And we put that into Kinesis. And Kinesis is what we use to track uh, a tremendous amount of data. And Kinesis is a, is a streaming service that we have. Uh, there, it's actually quadfurcated. I don't know if that's a real word. Um, into like four different services. So there's uh, Kinesis Data Streams, KDS. KDS is built and scaled on the concept of shards, where a shard gives you uh, one megabyte of ingest and, and two megabytes per second. So one megabyte per second of ingest and two megabytes per second of egress um, to be able to, to basically, as many shards as you want to provision, you can do that. Uh, so we have people who are ingesting you know, hundreds of gigabytes per second in Kinesis and KDS streams, uh, and then egressing that as well. Uh, and we recently released a feature that I was supposed to publish a blog post about today, but instead it's going to come out tomorrow. Uh, a few weeks ago, we released a feature uh, called Enhanced Fan Out for KDS for Kinesis data streams. It actually allows you to use an HP2 interface, which um, for those of you who aren't familiar with HP2, it basically gives you a uh, subscribe to shard API. It gives you, well, HTTP2 is. Um, uh, a binary wrapper around the regular HTTP protocol that allows you to have these kind of multiplex TCP connections that can deal with a lot more data in a, in a much more efficient way than traditional HTTP. So instead of having to make one request and one long-lived polling request, the server can actually send packets without you having to request them, uh, which is really, really useful in a streaming scenario. So you can, you can use this subscribe to shard API. You can say, hey, I want to connect to this Kinesis shard. And I want to be able to have the server push down any of the relevant info to me. Um, so it's pretty powerful. Uh, again, blog post about it coming out uh, tomorrow. And the second Kinesis service is Firehose. So Firehose is this ability to take all of that data, whether it's coming from a Kinesis stream or whether you're posting it directly into the Firehose, and send that into something else, whether that's Splunk, Elasticsearch, uh, S3, um, you know, what, you can send it somewhere else. It's basically a way to send it off to your data warehouse or something. Uh, and then in between those sits something called Kinesis Analytics, which is the ability to run regular SQL queries on that streaming data. So let's say you have JSON coming in and you want to run SQL queries on it. You can actually run real-time ML on that streaming data, which is really, really cool. So has anybody um, been to New York City? It's the greatest city in the world. Anybody lived in New York City? Anybody ever used City Bike? So City Bike is this service in New York City where they give you a key fob after you, you know, sell a kidney to pay for it. And you, you shove the key fob into the, the bike and you argue with the people on the phone on support and say, hey, my key fob isn't working. And eventually, so theoretically, you get this bike out of the console and you get to you know, drive around on the bike. And then you get, if you have it for more than 30 minutes, they charge you $400 a second. Um, every second after those first 30 minutes. It's like the Oracle billing model. Um, and then uh, you, you plug the bike back in. Now, this is a really cool service when it works. Uh, and and I, I used it when I lived in New York. I would commute on City Bike probably four days out of the week. And it was great. Uh, but there's a problem in that they have to uh, rebalance these bikes. Because if you think about it, everybody's coming from like the East Village at one time a day, going up to Midtown to go to their office. And then, well, OK, well, now it's lunchtime. Everybody you know, who didn't leave the East Village still wants to use a bike to go somewhere. Or maybe they're going into work late. But none, there are no bikes on the entire lower half of Manhattan. So they have these cars that roam around and detect hotspots. Uh, and they, they pull out those hotspots, and they rebalance where the bikes are. And this is done something using an algorithm called hotspot detection. And there's a really, really cool academic paper about it if anybody's interested. So doing hotspot detection on a static data set, pretty easy. You, know? like you, can, you can find that. Uh, you can ana analyze the um, taxi and limousine commission data from, from Uber and Lyft and, and taxis in New York City. You can find the hotspots all day. Doing it on streaming data, real data that's coming in in real time and detecting those hotspots and being able to, to shoot them off immediately for programmatic action, like a Lambda function or something, that is non-trivial. And with, uh, with Kinesis Data Analytics, it's literally like create stream, create pump, uh, analyze hotspots, and then all the results of that are all the hotspots. And you can do random cut forest. You can do a bunch of other algorithms, too. Um, and that's a really long-winded way of saying Kinesis is really cool. And I can talk about it at length if anybody's interested. The other thing of Kinesis is Kinesis video streams, which we, I think we talked about a little bit this morning, right? 
Um, and it's not just video streams. It's actually like any MKV encoded data. So we use Kinesis Firehose in this solution. <laughs> Did I just talk for like 10 minutes about the completely unrelated service? So we use Kinesis Firehose in this architecture. And what we're doing is we're having um, an EC2 instance that's listening for this Twitter. And it doesn't need to be an EC2 instance. It could just as easily be a Fargate container, or it could even be a Lambda function. But given that this is a long-lived call, this is a, a, uh, an API that we're calling and, and having this really long, open-ended connection, a Lambda function has a timeout of five minutes. So it might not necessarily be the best approach. Uh, so we're, we're pulling for all of these updates to Twitter. Twitter is sending them to our little EC2 instance or our Fargate container. We're posting those into the Kinesis Firehose directly. And what the Firehose is doing is it's calling out to a Lambda function to transform the record and enrich the record. And it's, well, well first of all, it's putting the raw records into an S3 bucket. And then when, those S3, when that S3 bucket um, gets a new raw JSON file uploaded to it, that triggers a Lambda function. That Lambda function will go and call out to translate and call out to comprehend to translate the, the, t the tweet text into the language that we want and to call out to comprehend to detect the sentiment and to detect key entities. Then that will go back to Kinesis Firehose and put it into a new bucket called Enriched. Uh, and the reason we store the data in both of these formats is that we want to be able to do a little bit of analysis later. Then we use a service called Amazon Athena. Um, this is a really, really straightforward service. Um, if we weren't recording, I'd, I'd say some things about it. But um, it, just, it just works. And it's probably very likely based on a very common open source framework that I'm sure you've all used. Um, but it just sort of, you know, you, you, you write queries. If you want to query your data in S3, you just say, hey, I want to query my data in S3. Let me create a table. Uh, and you, you say, this is JSON, or this is a CSV, or this is anything else that Presto is able to read. Um, Presto being a, an interesting word here, if anybody's interested. Um, everybody got that. OK, good. Um, then we can review that data with QuickSight. So QuickSight is a, a service that we use to kind of uh, visualize data. And I, I actually like it better than Tableau. I don't think it's quite as full featured as Tableau, but I do really enjoy the, how easy it is to get up and running with QuickSight, especially with data sets within AWS. All I do is I just kind of point it at an S3 bucket or point it in a theta table, and it'll go and infer the schema and, and make it really easy to query. So let's zoom in a little bit on this section of the Twitter reader. Uh, again, we, we have. Twitter posting these JSON files, again, that, that Twitter reader, it can run on EC2 or ECS or Fargate. Fargate, does everybody know what Fargate is? Um, Fargate is basically you have a Docker container, and you don't want to have to worry about any of the underlying infrastructure. You just want the Docker container to run in the cloud somewhere. And you say, hey, Fargate, run my container for me. Uh, and it does that. Um, and you have to specify, I think, you know, however many CPUs you want and however many uh, uh, What's the other thing? RAM, how much RAM you want. Uh, but beyond that, you don't have to specify anything. It'll figure it all out and run it for you. Uh, but if you want you know, special port mappings and stuff, you can do that. Uh, ECS is Elastic Container Service. And we use that pretty, uh, we use that quite a bit. Just checking, sorry, if um, there are any Twitter questions. Uh, OK, cool. No, no Twitch questions yet. So that container is posting things in the fire hose and going to that raw bucket on S3. Uh, this is me talking earlier about, I, I forgot I had slides for all of this, so I probably should have made it clear. Um, again, these are all the different Kinesis services. Um, once we have those uh, raw tweets in S3, we rely on an S3 event notification that triggers a lambda that goes out, calls to translate, calls to comprehend, and also posts those uh, enriched records back into another Firehose stream. So we put this in another Kinesis Firehose stream that will go and send these out to S3. Now, comprehend will let us detect sentiment, key phrases, languages, topic modeling, entities, all that good stuff. You guys saw this earlier this morning, I believe. And translate, obviously. Does anybody speak German? We talked about this earlier, or French, or anything. So one of the hardest things, actually, in 
in neural machine translation. And, and Translate, Amazon Translate, is actually powered by a, a, a type of translation called neural machine translation. And the way that this works is you basically give it a corpus of text, uh, and you do some sort of feature engineering and ML model learning, and you teach it that this corpus of text is similar to this corpus of text, figure out what the exact points in that are. And you can use all kinds of crazy technology, right? Like you can use LSTM for, for long-term, short-term memory. You can use embeddings, and you can use um, sequence to sequence, and you can use um, you know, whatever the latest, greatest tech is. What do, but that shouldn't really matter to a consumer. Uh, like The underlying tech that's being used to, to build this out shouldn't matter. What matters is I have an HTTP API. I have a bunch of text. I want to throw it into that API, and I want to get the response out. So one of the hardest problems in translation is actually going uh, from German compound word to uh, English language. Um, Germans make many compound words that are not real words. Uh, the words like Schlafhund are not recognized as real words. It just means like sleepy dog or sleep dog or Donau Dam Schlafgesell Schlafkapitän, which is like a riverboat captain on the Donau River. Um, with, and then you can extend it further. You can say it's like a riverboat captain on the Donau River with a five-star pointed hat. Um, and the, the, the real measure, in my opinion, of a tra neural translation service is how close that German compound word gets to uh, that English translation. And we actually have still the best result today with uh, Translate, which is pretty cool. It's very easy to use. Like I said earlier, um, you don't even need, like this code is wrong. We'll just fix that. You don't need keyword arguments if the first argument is the thing. And we're just going to call this translate. And then we're going to delete that. Not my slides. Sorry, I wanted to say thanks actually to all my colleagues who helped make these slides. Um, so we just import Boto3. We create an object called translate, translate, client. You know, straightforward, right? This is translating from en to, to de. Do you guys want to know something super cool about country codes in Unicode? This is completely unrelated to this topic. Um, <clears throat> in uh, the Unicode standard, you can add an offset to any country code, and it will give you the emoji of that country's flag. And if you don't believe me, I've got the code for it right here. Um, I'm a millennial, so I, I, like, I spend a lot of time dealing with emojis. Um, where is this? Yeah. So you can go and add this offset, which I think if you calculate it is like, I don't remember what it is. It's in the 1600s in like the Unicode spec. And all you do is you take the country code. So like the country code of the US is US, or the country code of, of like UK is like GB. Um, the country code of uh, China is like CN. You would take that. And you would add that offset, and it would give you the emoji flag. I just think that's awesome. It's a terrible thing for an encoding to support. Like You can actually do math in Unicode. So if you take Unicode numbers and you add them together, you get the right result, it, like, it, depending on how you add them together, so long as you write the carry bit yourself. Like, isn't that absurd? Like, I, I mean, I guess it makes sense, but that wasn't related to anything. I just felt like sharing that. You can tell where my mind is at today. So then it comes time to query that data lake. Now, there are two different ways that we can create these tables, these schemas, in Athena. The first way would be to manually create them. And it would be to say, like, create table of type, you know, these columns, these JSON fields, these embeddings. Um, that's really boring, and I don't like typing SQL. Uh, this is like 2018. I don't think any of us like typing SQL anymore. Uh, you, you know, maybe MongoDB solved that, maybe they didn't. Regardless, manually writing a create table command is something that in 2018 I shouldn't have to do. So we have this service called Glue, which is, and Amazon Legal has told me I have to stop saying this. Um, it is one of my favorite services, and I feel like it does not get enough love um, because the people who are using it like, have forgotten about it because it just sort of works in the, like, the background, and they, they never think to like, talk about how much time it saved them. And then uh, the people who don't know about it are like, wait, I never knew it could be this easy. So I'm going to demonstrate Glue in a moment. But what it does is it basically samples your data and it will infer the schema from your data for you, and then create a table in Athena for you to automatically query that data. And it will not only do that once, but you can set it to run and crawl and, and, and do this as many times as you want. And uh, it can also run PySpark jobs. So you can write a little PySpark script that it can even call out to SageMaker, call out to something else, and it will just run 
uh, indefinitely and, and keep adding in whatever kind of stuff you want to add to your data. So we could have actually done this entire thing in glue if we had wanted to. But I wanted to show other services, so we did not. Um, is this water for me? Yes. Okay. I hope nobody else used it. Sorry. Okay. So we can run glue. Uh, infer the schema from the tweets. Uh, that'll create some tables. Then we can even manually edit the, the schema that it creates. So for instance, it detects the, um, the Unix epoch time as an integer instead of as a date. We can just go in and change that field to a date. We're solid. Um, that was the only mistake that Glue made, I think. Uh, and then we, we get our little Athena table. And then we can write SQL queries against our Athena table. Um, but again, manually writing SQL is not fun. So what we do is we just hook it up to QuickSight, and we have QuickSight generate those queries for us. Uh, I think I have spoken way too much. And now I would like to show you things on the internet with the computers. So I'm going to open a couple of different consoles here. Uh, comprehend, uh, we don't need the comprehend console. We need quick site, though. OK. Uh, so let's start out over in EC2 land. So I have a couple of running instances. I think it's this one. Is it that one? I don't remember what it is. So instead, we're actually just going to go to CloudFormation. And you can see in CloudFormation, uh, does, it, does everybody know what CloudFormation is? Have I spoken about that at all yet? Oh, cool. OK. Um, CloudFormation is a service that allows you to basically take uh, JSON, uh, or if you're you know, sane, YAML, um, and put it into, you, you define your infrastructure as code. So you can define your VPC, which is your virtual private cloud. You can define your, your EC2 instances, everything, as code. And you can version it. Uh, and this is a really, really, really powerful construct because uh, if you want to make changes, like let's say I wanted to change which subnets were peered, or if I wanted to uh, deploy this exact same code in another region, it's really easy to do that with CloudFormation. I just take the, uh, the template. This is what the template looks like. Um, you know, it's just got a bunch of inputs, and it'll auto fill in those inputs for me. Uh, and it's pretty long. This one's a pretty involved template. Uh, and you can actually like import and pull from different templates. Has anybody worked with Chef or, or Ansible or um, SoftStack or uh, God forbid Puppet? Um, yeah. So it, it's kind of it's very similar to that, except it it doesn't really do this kind of um, ongoing uh, maintenance with an agent. Uh, Chef has this idea of you have to make these back end connections to uh, this agent over and over again to detect configuration drift and to reduce uh, heterogeneity within your clusters, all that good stuff. Um, but we do support Chef as well, Manage Chef, uh, through a service called OpsCode, um, which I don't like using. Not because OpsCode is bad, it's just because I hate Chef and Puppet. I'm an equal opportunity hater. So we can SSH into this instance. I'm just adding my, um, my key to my agent here. Uh, and if we look at this instance that's running, uh, I've got this Twitter stream producer.js. And this code was auto-generated for me by the, uh, by the CloudFormation template. So the CloudFormation template went in and, and created these config files and created all this other code for me. Uh, I mean, like this, a human wrote this code at some point, but after that, it has not needed to be modified by a human. It's auto deployed to the instance and all that good stuff. Um, so you can see what's happening here is I've got this little function, send a firehose. I'm, I'm basically I'm creating a, a, a twit, which is a, a funny. Um, it's a, a great name for an SDK. It's basically the the JavaScript version of uh, Python Twitter. And then we create a stream, and this is going to be on that statuses filter API. And we're going to pass in the, uh, the topics that we want. And we're going to pass in the languages that we're willing to listen to. So for each of those records that comes in uh, on tweet, 
we're basically going to post it directly into that Kinesis delivery stream that I was talking about earlier. And then all I do is I just run this whole shindig with no hub. Um, and I think it's still running. So if I go, let's see. Yeah, so it's still running. And it's been running since the 15th, which was really not that long. What's today's date? The 19th? 20th? So it's been running for five days. Um, I fully believe with the account that I put on it, uh, which has no rate limits because I yell at Twitter a lot, that we're going to have a ton of data. And I might have to delete some of that data to make it visible and useful. Because uh, when you have like a, a metric ton of data, uh, it is really hard to find the fun stuff, which are the tweets that I was going to hope that you guys would make right now. Um, but it's going to be impossible to find those in the mountain of data that's coming in. So I might, I might restrict it down to a smaller account in just a second here. Um, great. So uh, that's the EC2 instance side of things. And this is what the Kinesis side of things does. So everybody, everybody gets like the architecture, right? We go EC2, Kinesis, Firehose stream, Firehose stream to S3. So um, it's just, I've got to remember which one of these it is. Lots of data really fast is a really fun stream. Um, and this is the Kinesis data analytics thing that I was talking about earlier. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, so again, you just kind of define like your source. You, def you can go and you can say where you want your outputs to go to. Um, and then you can write your little SQL queries uh, however you want. So as you can see here, I'm just creating a couple of different streams. I'm, I'm doing anomaly detection. Just, it's like, it's pretty cool. Like, I, this is one of my favorite services. And lots, lots of people use this to pretty great effect. Uh, we're looking at the Firehose stream, though, right? So we're looking for the social media ingest stream. Which one of these says ingest? Ingest, there we go. So you can see this is coming in. We're getting, uh, I think, like a, a couple hundred KB a second. That's not right. I don't know what the, a couple hundred KB per, per minute. So not bad. Um, so it looks like we're collecting 30 tweets per minute. That's, that's OK. Uh, and then we're delivering it directly to S3. Um, and I don't remember if this is seconds or milliseconds. It's probably milliseconds. Uh, and yeah, so I mean, that's, those are your Kinesis Firehose stream. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to like think about shards or, or scaling it or anything. I just say, like, hey, send all my data to the right place. Straightforward. So then if we go into S3, da, 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 da. don't judge the number of buckets that I have. Um, I've been doing this a long time. We go into and see this raw stream, and we can just look at today. Um, what hour is it in UTC? Um, and you can see we get these files. And if we download this, Uh, we can see we have a JSON lines delimited tweet. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. OK. Well, don't worry about that. Let me just do it in the console. Um, there we go. And we can make it look pretty. Uh, and you can see uh, the the. We get the user data. We get the, um, uh, wow, that's not the right user to be looking at. Sorry. Uh, scrolling down a bit. This is the official AWS account. It's posting things. There should be something called tweet text somewhere. Tweet or text or status, maybe. Anyway, you get the point. There's the data. Is there anybody who has any questions so far or hasn't followed what I've the, the walkthrough? Any questions? OK, continuing forward. Every single time one of these JSON lines files is uploaded, 
uh, and we batch these together, we can tell the Kinesis Firehose how, how to batch the records, uh, it's going to trigger a lambda. And that lambda is going to be this one. And it's going to go out and call out to comprehend and call out to translate and then post those records back into another Firehose stream, which is going to put them in another uh, S3 bucket. Uh, this is kind of like a, it, it seems like this architecture is convoluted, but there's a reason that we design it in this way in that we can introspect into any one of these steps and add additional functionality. So if we wanted to batch things differently or if we wanted to add filters at any point in this process, we could uh, very easily. So all of this code is like open source. You guys can go look at it. Uh, the next thing that we do is we go over to Athena. And this is where we can start writing some queries. Uh, so I, I just have this table, this social analytics blog table. Um, and I can you know, run this query, which is going to say, select the entity and type uh, and count of the tweet entities where type is commercial item. Yes. No, you asked too much. Um, and the way that Athena is billed is you pay, um, I think it's like a dollar for every gigabyte scanned or something. Don't quote me on that. That might not be the exact right pricing. It might be like five bucks per gigabyte. Um, but basically, you can write your queries and you can create your indexes in such a way that you, you really are paying you know, micro cents per, per these queries. Um, it's pretty, pretty powerful in that way. So we could run a couple of other queries. Uh, we'll just grab all of them, and we'll see what the sentiment is. Um, and if we scroll to the side here, well, that did not work. This is not like being zoomed in, sorry. Um, so we can see the sentiment is positive. We can see what the score is. And this is all given to us from Comprehend. So we're calling out to Comprehend for the, each batch of these. And we're saying, hey, give me the results. Uh, and this is all well and good, right? Like Athena makes this super easy and fun and not awful like it would be if we were trying to like do it with PHP My Admin or something from 1990. Um, but what is way cooler than this is actually visualizing it. So that's where QuickSight comes in. And so we can hop over to QuickSight, uh, and we can go to the right region instead of, I don't know why this keeps putting me in Oregon every single time. I think it's detecting that I'm like closer to Oregon than I am to US East, and that's why it's putting me there. Or maybe I've like got some cookie that saved me as being in Oregon. Doesn't matter. But the way that this works is we can construct these dashboards uh, from the live data from Athena very easily. Uh, it's going to take just a second the first time that we're pulling it in on this dashboard to, to populate it all, just because it's, it's putting this into essentially like a solid state cache uh, specifically for QuickSight. Uh, and also, I did not limit my query in any way. So this is what I meant when I said uh, I needed to fix the data. So we're just going to delete all of that. Um, and we have a couple different tables here. And we can visualize this however we want. Um, we can map all the tweets. Should we do that? Map all the tweets? OK. So we're going to take the tweet ID. Oh. Take the tweet ID. Come on. Take. Jeez. Sorry. I keep clicking the wrong thing. Don't want the type. I want the tweet ID. I want the points on the map. Uh, and then I want to add these as latitude. No, this is geospatial. Come on. This goes here, and that goes there. And then we'll make the size be the count. Uh, yeah, the count. And then we could make the color be the sentiment or something. Uh, so this will load. And I'm sorry, it's in US East, so it's going to take a second to bring it over. A lot of data points. And one of the advantages of Kinesis Firehose is actually that uh, we could have sent that same data out to Elasticsearch. And then we could have used Kibana to visualize very much the same thing. Um, so if anybody has like an existing Elasticsearch cluster, you can just say, like, hey, send all my data to Elasticsearch instead. Uh, but I like QuickSight. I think this is a little bit more fun and easier to use than Kibana. I'm not biased uh, because I work at Amazon. I, I ran a 
massive Elasticsearch cluster at SpaceX for dealing with like business level metrics and also the um, the like the continuous integration of the rocket software and hardware. Uh, and I just never really want to touch Elasticsearch again because um, it's awful. Everyone agrees? Yeah, it's it's like an incredibly painful experience to run Elasticsearch at scale. I'm sorry if Elastic is watching. You guys are great partners, um, and I I do I like. I have a lot of experience with the service, so I feel like I'm qualified to say I hate it. Um, so let's look at Los Angeles. This is all me tweeting. Surprise is not more accurate than that. So uh, what are some other visualizations we could build? We, we created the, the sentiment, right? So maybe we want to like graph the sentiment. So we could say, uh, let's make a new visualization. Come on. How do I like close out of this graph and add a new one? There we go. Add visual. So we could say we want to take the sentiment category, uh, and we want to take the tweet ID, so we want to make the tweet ID like count. And we can even add filters in here, right? Like we can go out and we can say, okay, I want to filter on, you know, everything is going to be neutral, because uh, that's the most common sentiment given the English language's use of sarcasm. Um, so everything is going to come out as, as neutral. Uh, but you know, we could compare if we could filter out neutral. So we could say, um, I guess we couldn't filter out neutral. There's normally a way to. I, you can tell I don't use UIs very often because I don't remember. There we go. Yeah, exclude neutral. I don't know why that wasn't showing up the first time I clicked it. So then we exclude neutral, and our, our results are a little more useful. Um, and then we can save this dashboard. We can share it out. We can you know embed it over uh, HTML, so we could put it somewhere else. Uh, we can share it with people. We can share the analysis. We can capture a screenshot of it and uh, send that to people or capture a, a web page of it so they still get that interactivity. Um, and it looks like when we're tracking those topics, let's look at those topics that we were tra tracking again, because I don't remember what they are. I'm probably going to expose all of the credentials for this service right now. Um, so I'm just going to make it really, really small. Yeah, all the credentials are in there. So I'm just going to and then make it big again. No one saw that, right? OK, so no credentials. You know, what you could do if you didn't want to have the credentials put onto the instance itself, there are two different services that I strongly recommend for this. One is called Parameter Store. And Parameter Store, um, it has a, a couple of rate limits in place, and it's, it's designed for infrequent access. So you would cache these parameters locally, and it's really not designed for secrets. It, it, it'll, it'll support them. You, know, you could put uh, secret data in there with um, you know, an encrypted string, but it's much better to use Secret Store or, or, or Secrets Manager, AWS Secrets Manager. Um, and you can actually have Parameter Store call out to Secrets Manager transparently. So you can store the secret in Secrets Manager That'll have a rotation mechanism, so it'll fire off a Lambda function whenever it's time to rotate the secret. You can have it auto-update things, uh, all that good stuff. And it's got this like four-stage rotation mechanism. Um, and then SSM, or, C or, or Systems Manager, uh, Parameter Store, will call out to, to Secrets Manager to get the stuff. We're really great at naming things. And you can tell, because I can remember the name of absolutely every service. Um, basically, you take the concept and you put the word Amazon in front of it, and then you're good to go. So you can see these are the topics we're tracking. We're tracking AWS, VPC, EC2, RDS, and S3. And we're tracking the following languages, EN, Spanish, German, French. I don't know what AR is, and I don't know what PT is. Anybody? Portuguese, Portuguese and what is AR? Arabic. Arabic? OK. So I do not know language codes. We could filter by language, and we could see all that stuff. But you guys, you guys get how this works, right? Is there, are there any, I'm, I'm just going to open up the remainder of the session for questions. We can dive deep on any of the individual aspects that I've talked about, or even non-stuff like this. And you, there's a question over here. Uh, so it's, the data's coming from Athena. 
So we you can call Athena from anywhere. It's just an API. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 data that's in QuickSight is really, as far as I know, only accessible within QuickSight, uh, and it's so that's kind of a disadvantage. But the Athena data is available, you know, everywhere, and you get your query results back from Athena in like seconds. Like you could run across several terabytes. Yeah. Uh, the question, to repeat it, was. Oh. DynamoDB? Yeah, DynamoDB. Yeah. Because then I could just like overlay it with this and call it faster and also yeah. be able to get the UI, but also embed it as a JavaScript thing updating. So I could use that very fast. Yeah, yeah. if you want to see an example of that, um, demo app.cloud. Um, so I just built this uh, yesterday. Um, this is talking to DynamoDB on the back end. Um, and it's, you, you know, the, the microsecond thing that you're talking about with DynamoDB is actually empowered through something called DAX, the DynamoDB Accelerator, DAX, whereas DynamoDB itself is more in the millisecond range. If you want microseconds, you've got to run that DAX caching server. Um, not important for anything, but if you want me to talk more about that, it's really cool. It uses a protobuf um, definition, <coughs> custom binary wire protocol, all kinds of good stuff. It is. It's it's pretty damn good. I yeah, I'm glad you think so. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, the question originally was, uh, is there a way to get access to this data, you know, really quickly? And Athena is access to that data very quickly. I mean, your queries to Athena, uh, even across several terabytes, are going to be wicked fast, just because the way that it works under the hood is it's going out to S3 and it's saying, hey, S3, with all of your hundreds of thousands of servers. I want you to dive into each one of those partitions and figure out which one of these I need. Now, if you do uh, some ridiculous scan across you know, 10 billion trillion records, uh, yes, that is going to take more than a second, because you can't do a table scan and return all that data uh, it, you know, instantaneously. But if, you're, if you've got you know, some good filters in place and you're, you're returning that data very quickly, it, it will return um, quickly. But you don't really have to think about the partitioning. And if you, if you really need to be able to do those giant table scans and stuff, um, we also have a service called Redshift Spectrum, which is the ability to take um, a Redshift cluster, which is kind of data warehousing solution, uh, and call out into S3 from Redshift. Uh, it's pretty powerful. Any other questions about any of this stuff? Uh, which demo? Uh, sure, it's just demo app.cloud. Um, and I, I literally built this yesterday, uh, and it's not done yet, so don't judge me. This is demonstrating a, a global multi-region architecture. Um, so DynamoDB is a global multi-master, multi-write, whatever data, like y wherever you write from and wherever you read from, the data is consistent. Um, the, the thing with DynamoDB, it's really cool if you want to add like a global table. All you do is you just go and, um, you can add the additional endpoints. So unfortunately, you cannot do this right now on tables that already have data in them. And let me explain the limitation, uh, why, why that is. Um, so we have customers like Snapchat that use DynamoDB on the back end. Um, and they have, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but like a lot of data, as you might imagine. Who here uses Snapchat? For the purposes of any video, uh, that was 100% of the audience. Um, so I don't use Snapchat either, but my niece does. Uh, and everyone under 12 does, apparently. I don't know. Um, or everyone under 18. I, I, I don't really know what the demographics of Snapchat are, but I know that it's hugely popular and they have a crap ton of data. Um, and especially around times like New Year's and times like uh, the, the World Cup or the Super Bowl, they get a lot more data very, very quickly. So if you think about uh, New Year's Eve, that's like one of the, it's an event that's celebrated all around the world for about 24 hours. Um, so you have this huge increase in load over those 24 hours. And there's, there's a talk about this at reInvent. So if you want to go and look up this talk, if you just look up Snapchat reInvent 2017, you can watch um, an engineer from Snapchat explain how they use this. But I'm going to try and like, summarize that right now. They have to auto-scale their database, right? They have to auto-scale DynamoDB. So they go in here to, like, you know, this is just one uh, database that I have. 
Um, and they say, I want to turn on auto scaling. So all they do is they go over here, they turn on auto scaling, and they set the you know, maximum number of read capacity and the maximum number of write capacity that they want. And then what they do, since these Snapchat stories and stuff, they only last for uh, 24 hours, I think, or something like that. Uh, they then like remove all of that data over time after that. And you can do that in two different ways. With DynamoDB, you can set a TTL item. So you can say, I want this item to expire after 24 hours. But if you think about the way that that works, that would mean they would be replaying the exact same load that they had 24 hours before, 24 hours later. So they did something that I think was a little bit clever, which is uh, they actually just set an age out time, and then they slowly delete all of those items off so that they can keep their, their write capacity lower than it needs to be. Um, so they, rather than deleting it all exactly 24 hours later, they just change it to be visible or not visible, and then they, um, they delete it over the next like 36 to 48 hours. Uh, to, to kind of even out that load. And I, I like talking about stories like that. If you think, you know, you get into the billions of transactions per second scenario. Has anybody ever worked with a system with billions of transactions per second? Okay. It's a lot of fun. Um, your heart rate is typically much higher. Uh, I don't think my heart rate ever went below 130 the last time I was working on a system like that for like a solid year. Um, so my cardio was really good at the time. Uh, the uh, the, the downside of it is that you, you have to think about things in a slightly different way when you reach that scale. Uh, the solutions that work uh, at, at you know, a very basic scale will not necessarily work for, and basic being you know, up to a million transactions per second, will not necessarily work as you go to like billions and billions of transactions per second. But what I love about DynamoDB is they literally did not have to change anything. So it, it did literally scale to you know, these billions of transactions per second. It did handle that just fine. Uh, and it was just with auto scaling turned on. Uh, and it, there are very few services or, or tools in the world where you get that kind of flexibility. Now, I have no idea how much they paid for that. <laughs> but <laughs> I cannot imagine that it was particularly cheap. Uh, but it's still pretty cool. Um, any other questions about anything at all related to AWS? Yes. In your architecture, if I was interested in the statistics over a short window of time, let's say the last five seconds. I, I can't fully hear you. You said the statistics in the architecture? In that architecture where you showed the pipeline, if I'm interested in a dashboard, Yes. That shows me what's happened in a shorter window of time, let's say the past five seconds. Mm -hmm. Would I go to a different architecture? If you just wanted the past five seconds? Yes. Um, so within Kinesis Analytics, uh, you can publish another data stream, right? So you can, you can create what's essentially a, a sliding window. Are you thinking about with regards to IoT, maybe? So with regards to IoT, we actually have a completely separate solution that I think is, is a little more tuned for IoT devices. Um, and it has this concept of these windows where uh, maybe only the last five seconds are relevant for this analysis. And you, you can do this with Kinesis, you can do this with IoT. It doesn't, like, both services work, but if it's a specific IoT solution, um, this IoT analytics service is more tuned for most of those use cases. Not all, but most. Um, so I, I can create um, a simple SQL query and just run it uh, acro across the incoming data so this is just data from my laptop. Um, it's, have you guys seen Go High? All it does is it just returns, um, it returns some stats in JSON form about you know, what the currently executing processes are and stuff like that. So I, I just basically take that and I post it every few minutes to um, this IoT analytics stream. And then on a cron job, I can run and create uh, all this data. And then you can do a lot of other uh, interesting things too, like uh, uh, you can create these Jupyter notebooks that can analyze that information in real time. Um, but if you wanted to do it in Kinesis Analytics, uh, you just create a little sliding window. Pardon me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, where is this? So there should be something here that says window. I 
don't think I am using a window in this one. Uh, essentially, you just create a window function, and you say, I want every five seconds, and I want you to treat each batch of records as every five seconds. And then you can visualize that um, however you want. And if you want to change the scale in QuickSight, you can do that. Um, if you want to do additional monitoring and statistics about like whether something's trending up or down, you can do that as well with Kinesis Analytics. Yes, you can. You can. Um, that works pretty well, actually. Um, so I, I have an example of, of this running where I, uh, on Twitter, if you tweet at AWS Cloud Ninja, it will replace all the faces in the image with, um, with uh, little Cloud Ninjas um, because millennials. But the way that this works uh, with connecting a, a Lambda function is l let's just hop over to Lambda really fast. I don't remember what this function does at all, but I'm just going to add a Kinesis trigger. Um, and I just, you know, I add it to a stream. I have a bunch of different streams. And I can say, I want a batch size of 100, and uh, I want you to trim the horizon, or I want you to get me all the records from a certain timestamp, or all of that. So it's, it's all, it, the, the thing that I really love about all of this is that it is, it, it's all separate services that you can use in isolation, but they're also really well-defined integration points. So if you want to connect Kinesis and Lambda, there's a supported way of doing that. Uh, if you want to connect uh, you know, Athena and Glue, like there's a, a really good integration point there. So you basically find the gaps in your existing business or in your existing solution, and you use AWS to kind of fill that in. And Lambda can be another really cool piece of glue in all of your infrastructure. That's my sales talk. Are we all set? No other questions? Everybody solid? All right, well, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, we've got another session after this, so please stick around. And thank you, Twitch, for sticking around. Uh, feel free to tweet at me, at JR Hunt. Um, I'm going to run to the airport, and uh, I will not be back tomorrow. You're going to have the amazing Martin presenting instead. All right, thank you, guys.